night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, he will satisfy him and keep him out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, be with us on this special day of the year as we celebrate the resurrection of our risen Lord. And right now, open our ears, also open our hearts, that we might hear what you are going to share through Pastor Bruce from your inspired word. We ask this all in your name. Amen. God's not dead. God's not dead. That's the name of the movie that some of us have recently seen. God's not dead. It's the story of a professor and his students. He's a philosophy professor, and on the first day of classes... He challenges his students, and he asks them to write down on a piece of paper the word, words, God is dead, and they are to sign that paper. All of the students did that, except one. One of the students could not write down, God is dead, and sign his name to that. So the professor challenged him to defend God. He asked him to give some lectures to the rest of the students to have to convince them that God is not dead. The student did that. And in the end, as it turns out, through a lot of different things that happen, finally in the end, the students are persuaded and the professor becomes very frustrated and very upset. God's not dead. That's the message also that we celebrate today. The message of Easter. The message that is basic to our faith. It's the theme of our beliefs. God, Jesus, who died, is not dead. If God were dead, he wouldn't exist. But if Jesus arose, God lives. God is alive. Today, we are not thinking about a philosophy. We are not thinking about a religion or a psychology or politics. We are thinking about a person, about the person of Jesus who died and rose again. The message of the angel to the women was God's not dead. She said, the messenger said to the, the, the angel said to the women in verse 6, He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Think about those three phrases. He is not here. When the angel said that, he was referring, of course, to Jesus' body. He was not talking about his spirit or his soul. Sometimes at the cemetery, we make little comments that this person is really not there. We mean, of course, their spirit. Their body, of course, is there. But in this case, 
the angel was speaking about the body of Jesus. The body was not there. He is not here. And the angel went on to invite the women to come. He said, come and see the place where he lay. Jesus' body had been there. His body had been in the grave, but now the grave was empty. All of the signs of death had been very evident on Friday. Jesus had hung on the cross. Finally, he said, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit. The, so the soldier took the spear and pushed it into Jesus' side. Joseph of Arimathea came and claimed the body and wrapped it and anointed it and put it in a tomb. Jesus was dead. And now the angel said, he is not here. The grave that he was in is now empty. It is unoccupied. He is not here. And that message was confirmed by eyewitnesses. It was only a couple of weeks later that the disciples began preaching the message that Jesus was alive, that he had risen. It would have been very easy for anyone to simply go to the tomb to check it out for themselves. But no one could deny the message. The tomb was empty. He is not here. It was a real event, a fact of history. The tomb was empty. He is not here. And then the angel also said, he has risen. He did not just say he is alive, but he is risen. This was different than the raising of Lazarus. With Lazarus raising, Lazarus began to breathe. And he stood up and he walked out. Jesus restored Lazarus. But he did not resurrect him. To be resurrected means to be changed. It means to be transformed. Jesus now had a new spiritual body. Lazarus had to die again. Jesus now had a new body, a spiritual body. He was transformed. Jesus was not just restored, but resurrected. People have given various explanations for the empty tomb. Some have said, well, maybe the women went to the wrong tomb. After all, it was early in the morning and it was dark and they could have been confused. Perhaps in their confusion they went to the wrong place. Or others have given another argument and said, perhaps Jesus only lost consciousness. Perhaps he really was not dead and later he revived and... He walked out. Still others, starting with the, t the day of the resurrection, began to spread a rumor that Jesus' body had been stolen. That his disciples took his body and hid it. Now none of those arguments have stood up. True explanation is what the, the angel said to the women, he has risen. In a moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye, his body that had suffered and died was changed, transformed. No one ever had experienced that. He was the first and only one. But he is not the last one. The promise of Scripture is that all who are in him, all who know him, will also experience this on the last day when he returns. In a twinkling of an eye, Paul said, we will all be changed. We will experience this resurrection, the changing of our physical bodies into spiritual bodies. The angel gave the message, he is not here, he has risen, and then also included these words, just as he said. Just as he said. Those are important little words. The resurrection was not a surprise. Jesus had predicted it. God had planned it. And now it was fulfilled. It was just as he said. Jesus told that he would suffer, that he would die, and that he would rise again. Jesus was sure of the resurrection. He knew the Old Testament scriptures that foretold his suffering and his death and his resurrection. In Luke chapter 24, on the day of the resurrection, Jesus meets with his disciples and he says, This is what I told you. While I was still with you, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then it says, Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Brothers and sisters, that's the message we claim today. That's the message that comes to us. The message that Jesus who died is alive. And the message that repentance and forgiveness of sins is extended to us. That if we come in repentance, that our sins are also forgiven. and That we are also given eternal life. God's not dead. This is really what sets Christianity apart from any other religion. Other religions have teachings, as we do. Other religions have prayers. Other religions have rituals. They have some form of worship. But no other religion can claim a resurrected and living Lord. This is what sets Christianity apart. Confucius died, but remains in the tomb. Buddha died and remains in the tomb. Muhammad died and remains in the tomb. But Jesus died and is no longer in the tomb. What does this all matter? What difference does it make? For one thing, it means that God does exist. Only God could do what Jesus did. If we want to know about God, all we need to do is look to Jesus. It shows to us that God does exist. It shows to us also that our faith is based on facts. It establishes the truth of faith. And it confirms that what he said 
is trustworthy, dependable, that we can base our lives and faith on it. There are really only two responses that we can make. Either we can believe this or we can deny it. We each need to do that personally. I remember one of the first times that all of this seemed to make sense to me. Between eighth grade and high school year, I went to Bible camp. And there in Bible camp, we had a missionary speaking during the week, and it came to the Friday night commitment service. At the commitment service, we each were given a a lighted candle. And in the chapel there, we formed in the shape of a cross, each holding our our candles. We sang together a song that I hadn't sung before, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Have you made that commitment? Have you said, I have decided to follow Jesus? Let's sing it together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. I hope all of you have made that decision to receive Jesus as Savior, and then to follow Him. We're going to have a prayer now, and if you want to do that, you can simply, in prayer, say that to Jesus. Say, I believe that you died on the cross for me, and you rose again for me, and I want you to be my Savior. Let's pray. If you want to pray that prayer, you may follow me and your own thoughts with these words. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe that you died and rose again for me. Thank you for paying the price for my sin. Thank you that you forgive me and I give my heart to you today. And if you want to recommit yourself to him, you can say, yes, Lord, I've decided that I want to follow you more closely. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, but the cross and the empty tomb before me. 
Lord, as we today commit ourselves anew and afresh, help us to do this, each personally coming to you, acknowledging our sin, and trusting you as our only Savior. Bless us, Lord, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our service today with the Hallelujah Chorus.